It goes on for three minutes, and it's pretty cool. And they just put it on YouTube. And in five days, they got four million views that they didn't pay for, because they designed it around shareability. They worked out how you can seed it, how you can design it to make people want to share it. So we're in that kind of new world. We're in a world where Michelle Fan, from her bedroom, talks about makeup, shows how she can make herself look like celebrities. Suddenly a billion people, or a billion views, have been seen, and she's got makeup deals. Big professional makeup companies are having to go through her and pay her to promote their goods. Instagram is now the place in Kuwait you buy your sheep. This is actually a real valid phone number. If you want to buy a sheep for a loved one, um, this is a live <laughs> site. Because that's how people are reaching audiences. And again, the old contract with you pay somebody to do something, that's all kind of disappeared. I'm going to tell you um, why some of these entrepreneurial thinkers are making mar marketing an interesting place to watch at the moment. Um, I'm going to tell you about five entrepreneurs I've spent some time with lately. Um, this man grew up in communist Ukraine, came to America as a refugee age 16, lived on welfare, lived on food stamps, dropped out of computer science at university, wasn't really interested, but kept thinking when he was a teenager, it was just too expensive to keep in touch with his family back in Kiev. Um, he couldn't afford the phone calls. What if he could use the network to find a low cost way to connect people. So he had an idea. And you kind of know where this story is going to end. Half a billion monthly active users later, Facebook buys WhatsApp in February for $19 billion. But what's really interesting is in the four years that it took them to build up 500 million active monthly users, how much did they spend on a combination of marketing plus advertising plus PR? So it's a new kind of exponential world where you can create a product and very, very few people, 50 in the office of WhatsApp, and design a product, both around solving a problem and being incredibly simple. They wouldn't add details and being shareable. There's a note um, on Jan Koom's desk written by his co-founder, Brian Acton. No ads, no games, no gimmicks. Let's just do the one thing really well. And if people like it, they'll tell other people. Although, um, when it was sold for 19 billion, the BBC reported something that helped me understand the valuation, that it was an incredibly valuable massaging service. <laughs> that makes a bit of sense. Um, I'll tell you about Jan Kuhn because of this exponential idea, the idea that in the last century, <coughs> businesses grew in a linear way, one plus one plus one, by the 30th step, you get to 30. But in a connected network, Moore's Law era, where you're doubling capacity at each step, by the 30th step, you get to more than a billion. And that means you can kind of grow something so quickly that it's reached the inflection point before you've actually noticed. And that curve is still happening in computer processing power. This is the Intel Edison, a really strong processor the size of an SD card. We haven't reached the limits of physics yet in the Moore's Law Curve, but the same thing is happening in other sectors. It's happening in the falling cost of solar energy, one of these exponential curves. It's happening in the falling cost of sequencing human DNA. That's the green curve actually falling more steeply than <coughs> Moore's Law. And suddenly, the future arrives. You know, if this same curve hits an industry like data storage, and that comes to near zero, well, you can create a whole new thing called cloud computing. Let's create a, a new industry. And it's happening to consumer behavior as well. A new device comes on the market. And if you say 50 million units is kind of mainstream adoption, that is accelerating as well. So traditional industries have a challenge because they've got a nice business model. You know, they're like Kodak selling the film. And kind of, you don't really want to notice that digital is coming along on that curve. Just think of WhatsApp. And its reach. Um, another person I want you to meet is Tony Fidel, who made nice things at Apple. He led the team that made the iPad, the iPod, 18 generations, and then this new thing Steve Jobs asked him to make called the iPhone, three generations of that. 
and then he left to build the thermostat. So why would a man with one of the coolest jobs in the world leave to create the thermostat business? Well, because he saw that the Internet of Things, the sensor-embedded world, was actually becoming a reality. And the Nest thermostat learns. It knows who's in the room. It monitors your behavior. There's all sorts of algorithms that try and encourage you to save energy, but also they know when you're not likely to be in the house. Google bought Nest in January, $3.2 billion. It's a company with two products, a smoke alarm and a thermostat. So why does Google want to invest so much? Well, you know, obviously they got some of the world's greatest engineers and designers with Nest. But it's also, think about the power that Google has if it is the company that controls that dashboard to your home. Because there's a bit of a fight breaking out now to see who can be the proprietary dashboard. There's different standards competing. The amount of knowledge that a company would have based on knowing about behavior in the workplace, in the home, in real time. If I mentioned Tony Fidel, just because the value that <coughs> accrued in its short life at Nest, whilst it was independent, is to a large extent, I think, because they saw and they understood how to use the fact that we're in a digital, non-digital combined world. There's no point anymore talking about commerce and e-commerce, online and offline. Everything is connected. You know, there is oxygen, which is digital connectivity. And you have to start thinking about the opportunities when everything, from your shoes to your coffee cup, has a sensor in it that's connected to the network. So many of you are probably wearing these kind of devices. Maybe your dog is now wearing these devices. Anything you can put a sensor in that gives you data back will have a sensor in. So already we're getting products like this basketball that sends messages back to your phone saying how good your shots were. We're getting internet connected smart locks. This is Locketron. If you want to open your holiday home up to guests 3,000 miles away, no problem. Just click. In Star Trek, Mr. Spock had the tricorder, a sensor-packed device he wore around his neck that could tell you what was wrong with you, diagnose illness, help you get better. Well, there's now a company in California called Scanadu that makes this device. It says it's going to release this year for $150 that is packed with sensors. You touch your forehead, it takes all your body metrics and helps diagnose. It's the start of something really interesting. So at Wired, we um, did a little project, what would happen when our life is connected. So if you're driving along, the taxi will get automatic directions based on your online schedule. The sandwich shop would start to prepare your order as you approach, because it knows you're there. Probably more importantly, the smartphone warns you of an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend ahead, so you can <laughs> cross the road. At Mobile World Congress in Barcelona earlier this year, um, a PR company monitored the Twitter buzzwords. And Internet of Things was way out there, above wearables. Everybody said this is the year of wearables. Privacy, not so much. And I think lots of companies making stuff are now going to have to think of how they can make stuff that's part of that connected world. So we're already getting signs in you know, kitchen equipment. This is a company called Orange Chef that makes the smart chopping board that kind of knows what's on it, connects to an app, helps you cook things according to you know, the recipe that would suit you. Not everything is going to revolutionize your life. This is the milkmaid. It's a jug packed with sensors that you pour your milk in, and when your milk is starting to go sour, it will send a message to your iPhone. So presumably you rush home from work and change your jug. I wouldn't invest in this one. The future of oral care is coming soon. Toothbrush. Introducing the new revolutionary Bluetooth connected toothbrush from Oral B, developed together with dental professionals, arriving June 2014. With this power brush and app, you and your dental professional can customize your brushing experience and receive personalized guidance to stay on top of your oral care. Each brushing session. I don't session know about you, but I don't want to be in the bathroom with my dentist telling me what I'm doing wrong. But, you know, this is the start. And then a new device comes out, the latest iPhone, and it has a new technology inside it. Apple calls it iBeacon, using low energy Bluetooth, where you can send a message 
maybe 100, 200 meters between a store and a potential customer who it knows who's on the other side of the road, you can entice people in. And you think Apple's doing something quite interesting because they've got Touch ID, the biometric login, and they know exactly where you are in real time. So maybe Apple's thinking we could be a payments company, a very, very simple one-touch transaction payments company. You know, the rules suddenly change. So in a world where there are sensors everywhere, little tiny powerful computers, you can transact without even noticing, services built into these things, and there is no offline anymore. There's real value. So Cisco talk about it as $19 trillion worth. John Chambers, the boss of Cisco, says it could actually be 10 times as significant this sensor embedded world than the internet we've known so far. Gartner's talking about you know, 26 billion, they're guessing. Probably gonna be more than this as the price of the sensors comes down. Um, many of you, I'm sure, own the internet connected smart toilet, the Sartis. It's about 5,000 euros. Well, you probably aspire to it if you don't own one. Um, it's really cool. It has automatic flushing and deodorizing from the Android app, and you know you can set it to heat the, the seat and make the lid. Anyway, a security consultant in August published a report warning that the Sartis internet-connected toilet was hackable. <laughs> if someone didn't like you, maybe a business competitor, they could access your system to set your toilet flushing or deodorizing all night. <laughs> and I tell you this not because I think the key takeaway from Berlin should be you learned about the hackable toilet, um, but because we need to start thinking about security in this world, in this networked world, where you're only as good as the weakest link. And I think this is going to be a major public policy issue and consumers are going to have to trust. Another entrepreneur I want to introduce you to is Demis Hassabis, who has an office above or opposite Russell Square Underground Station in London, where he sits with 50 of the world's smartest PhDs, kind of not really making a product. They haven't made a product yet, but they are trying to teach the network how to think like a human. His company is called DeepMind, and they're working on general artificial intelligence, which means not just linguistic artificial intelligence, but whatever task you give the computer, see how it learns. When I went to see Demis, he was really excited that he taught the computer how to play Space Invaders. Just using the pixel inputs, they'd given it with no instructions to the network, to the machine, and the first half hour the computer kept dying. About half an hour later it started recognizing the patterns and knew when to hide. An hour later, Demis said, it was the best Space Invader player in the world. Um, as I said, Demis hasn't released a product. It didn't stop Google buying his company again in January for 400 million pounds. So something else is happening. So AI is going real, it's going mainstream. I don't know if you saw the film Her. Theodore Twombly. Welcome to the world's first artificially intelligent operating system. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay. Are you social or antisocial? Uh, I guess I haven't been social in a while. How would you describe your relationship with your mother? Uh, Thank you. Please wait as your operating system is initiated. Hello, I'm here. Hi. Hi, I'm Samantha. So I'm not going to tell you how it ends, but he falls in love with the operating system and it's not a happy ending. Um, <laughs> we're going to look back on her in 10 years and think, it's all obvious, you know, it'd be like a documentary. Because I think we're heading towards that world where the network will be much more human. It will kind of hoodwink us into trusting it. Two more entrepreneurs you need to meet. One of them... I introduce him for his kind of attitude to business and how he doesn't accept the rules. So in his office in Stockholm, he's got a Stratocaster guitar on the wall with a little quote above it from George Bernard Shaw that the reasonable man adapts himself to the world and the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. 
So all progress depends upon the unreasonable man or woman. And it's kind of how Spotify has become so successful. Daniel Ek, seven years ago, eight years ago, knocks on the record company's door saying, you know you've got this really profitable business selling this plastic thing. I'd like you to stop that. Give away your music. Trust me, it's going to save your business. And they kind of laughed and said goodbye. And he persisted. And, you know, streaming may not bring in the same revenue as CDs, but it's creating a sustainable business model. That's his valuation of the last fundraising round. That was before Apple bought Beats, so it's probably up. I just think we need to understand how quickly um, a very successful established business model can suddenly be made irrelevant by what digital connectivity does. Um, and the last of the entrepreneurs is Travis, who runs a little business called Uber that's going around the world annoying taxi drivers. Um, Uber is all about the simplicity of the experience. They don't own any cars. They have a very, very easy to use app that connects you and the driver. You rate each other. Uber takes 20% of all the money. But they make it really easy to use. You don't even have to type in your credit card number now when you join. You just take a photo of it. It will scan it. That's how much they were valued at two weeks ago when they raised their latest funding round. They don't own any cars, okay? Um, and I think we need to think about getting out of the way of the consumer experience, getting the friction away. It's the design experience that will win. It's you know, David Sachs, one of the PayPal founders, talks about Uberification. You know, that one button access to the product you want. And that's why companies like Amazon are building supermarket chains. Why does Amazon want a supermarket that's got 100,000 items? Not because it wants to take on the big supermarkets, but because it wants to deliver same-day delivery. It's building the infrastructure to do that. eBay is doing one-hour delivery in cities like New York. So you start to understand the consumer's friction is they don't have very much time. They want something now, on demand. So I'm starting to see you know, books. Alexis Ohanian, one of the founders of Reddit, <coughs> published a book last year. At the, at the back, it tells, you, it tells you this is a five-hour read because it appreciates you don't have endless time. If you go to Medium to read journalism, next to each headline, it tells you how many minutes it's going to take you. It's kind of respectful for the busy person, because I don't know anybody here who says, I have lots of spare time. So I think we can learn from the thinking of some of these fast growth entrepreneurs. If you go into the Google building in Mountain View, they have posters like this on the wall and get people to think really ambitiously. You know, what about when the web is 100 times faster? In Facebook's building, they've got you know, posters like this. Move fast and break things. Done is better than perfect. Get the product out there, and then iterate. Is this a technology company? Somebody's written underneath. Uh, no, it's a poster-making company. <laughs> but these are your competition. Um, and they talk about growth hacks instead of conventional marketing. And by growth hacks, I mean using some of that engineering mindset, a combination of data analytics, testing, measuring, a bit of psychology, a bit of Daniel Kahneman, and working out what small changes at low costs can have big results in getting people coming in. And I'll tell you a couple of the heroes of this world. Back in 1996, these two gentlemen Jack Smith, Sabir Bhatia, had an idea for a new email service. It's going to be free. And they got some money from a venture capitalist called Tim Draper. And they thought, we can spend some of that money on marketing. We'll take poster sites, we'll do some radio. And Tim Draper said, why don't you put something at the bottom of each email? They said, we can't. That would be spam. People would get annoyed. And he kind of kept pushing them. And in the end, they decided, OK, they'll try it. But they won't have the PS, I love you. They'll have the get your free email at Hotmail. And it started pretty small. And then it started taking off and going crazy until Microsoft bought them. And one of Tim Draper's partners talks about it in a viral way, like an illness. 
you know, it was like as if Zeus had sneezed all over the planet. Every time somebody in a new territory got the email, suddenly they noticed a cluster of new registrants there. So growth hacking targets five aspects of this consumer journey. It's about acquiring people, getting them to be active, getting them to stay, to tell others, and the golden egg, getting them to spend money. And it's a whole bunch of things from landing pages. It's really worth looking at how people like Uber experiment in trying to get you to sign up. Dropbox has done all sorts of iterations, and they realized they want a very simple three-word description of what they are, very simple sign-up, and then there's a video you can click if you're confused. In Groupon's case, they do a combination of localizing the site, but also they have other versions that are not local, so they can vary according to how you come in. Do you come in through search, or do you just go and type in the URL? Twitter's tried all sorts of things. Um, they've got a whole bunch of data scientists there. Um, and they worked out once you encourage new users to follow 10 people, then they're much more likely to come back and stay loyal. But it's getting them over that first hump. So it's a combination of you know, being a bit of a scientist, testing constantly, trying some virality, trying some SEO. Working out the product is actually what the market wants at the time, and then maybe modifying things. Lots and lots of data analytics. Sometimes maybe tell a few stories. That UX. And it's not sectored. It's not in, you know, here's the marketing person, and here's the behavioral science person. It has to be embedded. It has to really come from the top. Because we need to get marketing people thinking like engineers and engineering people thinking like marketers. One of the people who commentates about this talks about a blurring of line between marketing and product and engineering. So if you're a startup, you don't have a fixed guide to where you're going. You don't have much cash. But you have the potential to go like this. So that's why these people are frantically obsessing about what is it that can give us that hockey stick growth. So at Dropbox, they experiment all the time. And they know that they can gain you. If you connect through your social media, you'll get a bit of extra storage. But that means you're much more likely to come back and to share. At the beginning, Drew Houston experimented with different types of landing pages. He did some SEO, but he found out it was costing him almost $400 for each person who converted. That wasn't going to work. So then he started experimenting with giving away more and more storage space. So in a month, with a two gig free offer, and you got free storage space if somebody clicked on your link, nearly three million direct referrals. So that's the product doing the work for him. Some people use email, traditional email, still to get you coming back. AngelList will send you a weekly email. BuzzFeed constantly measures. They have dashboards where they work out in real time where the links are coming from. Are people sharing this story on this social network? Is this particular type of story doing better at the moment? They're learning and they're iterating. Um, this man I spent some time with a couple of months ago, Chamath Palapatia, who screwed up at Facebook in 2007. They created a product that he led called Beacon, which kind of published all the stuff that you were buying elsewhere. Big trouble. They were sued, class action, the media were all over them. And he thought he was going to get fired. He thought, I need, a, I need a way to kind of get rid of my guilt. So he said to Mark Zuckerberg, can we create a growth team where we work out you know, kosher ways to grow Facebook's network? And so he led this team. He also did a good deal with Zuckerberg. He said, I think they were at about 50 million, 40 million users at the time. He said, um, don't give me a huge amount of money now, but if I can get you up to a billion, give me like a nice multiple of that amount. 
So the three principles we worked on, pretty simply, keep measuring, keep testing, and keep experimenting. And it meant, you know, the same principles that games companies use, A-B testing, two different players don't play the same game. It's the optimization that the Obama campaign used in 2008. 24 versions of their home page, different wording for sign up, for what pictures there were, and they found out that the one that had the most click-throughs was this. It says, learn more. Nice family picture. But the numbers behind it, the data told them, they wouldn't have known. That one, compared with the other one, went from 8% click-through to 12%. And the Obama team said, actually, we wouldn't have known that this one was going to earn us an extra $60 million in campaign donations. So it's about trusting the data. The companies like um, 37 Signals that run High Rise keep experimenting. They published this case study. Originally, they had this fairly busy homepage, but they thought, why don't we do a really long letter as a homepage telling people why they'll love our product? So they did. And it worked. Acquisition was up. And they thought, well, let's experiment. What about a person? They tried a person, and it doubled acquisition. And they thought, well, obvious. Let's have a person and the long letter. They sent it down. Again, they couldn't have told this. Then they thought, what about different people? So for some reason, Michael is better than Jocelyn, but John really didn't work. Maybe it was the coloured background. So what Chamat and his chums did at Facebook was interesting. If you're in Japan, you'd be encouraged to tell Facebook your blood group, because they worked out that there were cultural resonances in Japan, that people felt more likely to trust each other if they knew what blood group they are. But in Russia, it was very different. So when they started growing in Russia, they bought SEO words for every Russian citizen because they knew that as they started going on the desktop internet, they typed their name first. And if Facebook was pretty high up, that was a pretty good way to acquire. Other businesses force you to log in through a social site. It's a pain at the beginning, but you're much more likely to be loyal. This is core. Cool. So Airbnb, which um, in four years has just overtaken Hilton, in, the, in terms of the number of hotel rooms they have. Hilton's at about 620,000, Airbnb's about 650,000. It doesn't own any of the rooms, it doesn't have to change sheets. Um, they did growth hacks including finding a way to make it easy for people to click a button and their listing would automatically be cross-posted on Craigslist. They had to hack the Craigslist API, but it suddenly grew. LinkedIn, they're obsessed by this. Again, they tried buying people's names. They worked out whether that was cost effective. The best thing they did was they created a widget to make it easy for you to upload your contacts from a whole bunch of different email services. They also, quite early on, 2004 to 5, realized that a lot of people were not joining LinkedIn because they thought it looked like they were advertising they were looking for a job. So it looked at the psychology. And it thought, why don't we create a second site inside LinkedIn called LinkedIn Jobs? So therefore, if you weren't on LinkedIn Jobs listing, you weren't coming to LinkedIn because you were desperate to leave your current job. Josh Elman, who is one of the people at LinkedIn, who's now an investor at Greylock, um, is involved with this company called Nextdoor, local community networks. And he was telling me that they've tried some interesting hacks. First of all, validating you in the neighbourhood, it's often sending a postcard to you, but then they send a message in a new territory they're approaching. If someone registers, they'll get a message saying, thanks for registering, we can't make your neighbourhood live until we've got 50 members, so help us spread the word. And people do. So when they've got 50 members, they get a message saying, that's great, but you'll have a much better relationship with your local community, your local police, once we've got a thousand members. They measure it works. So there's endless examples. GifGaf is a phone network, a peer-to-peer -peer phone network. It's owned by Telefonica, which owns O2, but it's a very, very low-cost virtual network using O2's infrastructure. If you're in the network, you get free calls to anybody else in the network. If you answer other people's customer service questions, you get free credit. If I introduce you, we both get free credit. 
is growing really fast. Upworthy, again, it's all about measuring. One of these viral news sites, okay, they've got their own science, which includes data and UX and a bit of luck, but they write 25 versions of each headline to work out which is likely to be the most clicked on. So they had this story about what a white guy thinks. How hard is it to be a white guy? 25 different headlines, and they tested them. The first one that came up, a public service announcement on behalf of all white dudes. The second one, put yourself in a white guy's shoes. Comfy, right? Which one do you think is going to win? A or B? You probably don't know, but the data knows. This one got 32 times as many clicks. 't time of science to this. Robert Cialdini wrote the great book about persuasion called Influence, and he talks about there are six classic tools to get people persuading. Social proof, everybody else is doing it, why don't you? Reciprocity, here, let me give you something, you'll give me something back. Scarcity, limited time offer, do it now. Likeability, the used car salesman's trick, be charming. Okay, the celebrity's using this, why don't you? and you create a habit. It's worth reading Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, if you want to understand some really good case studies of how companies grew loyalty using these tools. Because we're in a world where these devices are, again, falling to zero. In Barcelona, Mozilla launched or announced its $25 smartphone. These are the 20 euro iPods, iPads being used in India. This is the a cash tablet that costs these girls about twenty dollars. Color touchscreen Android, and the phone is becoming everything. Your doctor, you know, medically valid ways to collect your medical data now through the smartphone. And then wearables. Wearables probably won't look like this. Probably won't look like this either. I don't think they'll look like this for most of us, unless it's for a professional job. They don't really enhance your identity. The Robert Scoble, the tech journalist, loves his Google Glass. He wears them the whole time, day and night. If you don't want to see a grown man in the shower in his Google Glass, look away now. Um, there's even companies like, this is one in London called Ease, that's trying to make it cool to pay for things using your Google Glass. You may laugh, but he got the girl. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to work either. Much more likely to be in stuff that we already live with. This company called OmSignal makes fabrics with sensors embedded. So this one has sensors that tell your heart rate, how many steps you've taken, your breathing, and your mood. According to this, he's excited. More likely to be in stuff that you wear when you're skiing. You know, you already wear goggles. The recon displays how fast you're going, the weather. Or a wristband. This is the NIME that collects your heartbeat signals. Everybody's got a unique signal, and it uses it to authenticate your doors or your computer. And then virtual reality suddenly starts to become credible with the Oculus Rift and similar technologies. In um, Norway, already they're getting the army using them so that the tank drivers can see around the corner and see extra information as by our own. You have to be ready for these new things. There's a company in Stockholm called 13th Lab that uses augmented reality just through a phone. You can play games in the office and shoot your colleagues. <laughs> report place. Twelve years ago this was side <coughs> Now it's 
pretty much every day. So I'm going to leave you with um, some of that thinking that you get in the startup world, which is kind of if you have to pay to market your product, maybe if you have to pay to get people to come and link to your page, maybe it's the product that's wrong. As somebody said on the internet. Thank you. And if anybody wants to shout or ask questions or throw a new idea in, there are a couple of people with microphones ready for you. So they will look for hands that are up. Ask me anything. <laughs> Where do you think this is going to end? Are we just going to be on a sofa somewhere with everything happening to us without us actually having to move at all? So, so I repeat that. Are we going to end up like Wally or all those over overweight Americans just sitting around eating, not doing anything? Um, <laughs> I'm actually an optimist that technology is going to make us live longer and healthier. If you think about implants, if you think about, I don't mean those sorts of implants, I mean, you know, cochlear implants to help people who can't hear, or retinal implants, or prosthesis, and robotics is getting really interesting. A friend of mine who's paralysed um, is using an exoskeleton that's not just helping him stand upright, but training his muscles. I think it depends how you use it. I think you have to think flexibly. I think you have to assume that a lot of the tasks that we have today will be automated. But then if you are a truck driver or a taxi driver, maybe it's not going to be such a bad thing long term that you're replaced by a self-driving car. It's not going to be fun in the short term, but maybe you will get a more fulfilling way to spend your day after that. It depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist. Question over here. Microphone coming. Oh, yeah, a question from my side. The, the convenience and uh, for the end consumer is obviously the holy grail, but there's always this trade off with uh, data being given by consumers. Could you comment on how you see that evolving towards the future and um, sort of the trade off of giving more data yourself and then being used for convenience? So the worry is. Very, very few companies control vast amounts of data that used to be either protected or only you would control. Um, personally, I'm very wary about what I put out on social media because I know it can be used for reasons that aren't necessarily of benefit to you. Um, <coughs> the trouble is, the millennial generation has accepted that contract that if stuff is free, then you are the product. And there will be regulators, especially in Germany, places like this, where you still believe that privacy matters. It's unfashionable, though. The problem with Facebook and Google and Apple is they're more powerful than national governments. And they're kind of lobbying very hard to stop the limitation of what happens with people's data. The big debate over the European Union's request that people should be able to delete some of their search history um, shows that <coughs> privacy may have been a 20th century concept. You can still choose not to put things online. I speak as somebody, um, sadly, who's never liked something on Facebook. <laughs> Just, I don't like them knowing my behavior. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.